handouts for today. Terry, did we get that one? Mm -hmm. All right, are you ready to begin? Yes, today, I think there aren't any. It says July 2nd on the bulletins that are over there. It's the bulletin should be correct. It says July 2nd. It should, if this one, the parable of sowers, in there, it's the yes. correct one. Okay. 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 So grab it. All right. All right, let us, uh, let us prepare our hearts today. We're going to have you hear the lesson entitled the Parable of the Sower. It's found in the book of Matthew, the 13th chapter. The same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by a lake, such a large crowd had gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then they told him many things in parables and said, He said, A farmer went to sow a seed. As he went and scattered the seeds, some fell along the pathway, and the birds came and ate it. Some fell along rocky places where it did not have much soil, sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, the withered, they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell amongst thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still others fell on good soil, where it produced a crop. 160, 30 times what was sown. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. Anyone who hears the message about the kingdom does, does not understand it. The evil one comes and snatches away that which was sown in their hearts. This is the seed that was sown along the path. The seed falling on the ground refers to someone who hears words, the word, and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, it only lasts a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word but worries of his, for his, of his life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding 160, 30 times what was sown. The gospel of our Lord. Through the grace to you, O Christ. Bless us, God, today as we open up your holy word. And may we be inspired by your presence. And with your joy and your peace, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You're welcome, as I said, to pull out your handout for today. Again, those online, welcome to download that or take a look at that as a part of the lesson for today. And I want to start because this is an interesting parable, this parable of the sower. And I found it interesting. I've never preached on this message, which is hard to imagine all my years preaching. I've been preaching for a long time, but I've never done this. But it reminds me of a, a story, uh, because again, this is uh, about Jesus being accepted and his message being rejected by some people, and the disciples were kind of confused about it. And maybe you know what it's like where you've done something really nice and very kind for people, and sometimes they accept it, sometimes they don't, and it's like, I went through all this effort, and this is the way I'm going to be treated? Are you kidding me? And sometimes it's easy to get very cynical about that. And I'll tell you, one of the stories that happened actually this year, and this is at our Christmas program, our Eve of Christmas Eve program. Maybe you're aware of, uh, if you were there or present for that, we had a program that was geared towards the community. We invited our other congregations, both Manna from High and New Day Ministries. And we had a really nice service there. Now, here's the interesting thing. The other congregations were in charge of bringing the, the snacks for that. So we got over, we got over here, and uh, there were, you know, the one church brought maybe, I think, like a half dozen cookies. And, you know, another box that was kind of half filled. They were already clearly picked through and so forth. And that was all we had. Now that doesn't sit well with my wife, who just looks at that stuff because she's kind of the, uh, she, she, is, she just feels like she's got to take care of these things. So she looks at this and says, people are going to be really upset when they come down here. So she skipped the service, went over the house, grabbed all the cookies that she'd made for the family and for the, the events that we were going to have. I mean, I don't know, 20 dozen cookies or whatever it is she brought over. It was ridiculous. But she just filled the place. When we came down, everything was decorated. Everything was taken care of. It looked the way it was or, or that you would expect from the hospitality of the church. But honestly, it was one person who did it, by the way. And so it was, it, it was great. Everybody's having a good time. But apparently some woman came up and was griping and sniping about this. And, well, you shouldn't do this. And there's not enough plates. And there's not this and that and blah, blah, blah. And it's easy at that point. You're like, okay, I did all of this stuff. And this is the way I'm going to get treated. See, that's where the cynicism comes. Cynicism comes in, right? But we need to remember that it's one person. Because I will tell you, I was grateful for it. And I bet you any of you else, some of you were here, right? 
you saw what went on, you probably came down, down, didn't know that that took place behind the scenes. But you were probably grateful for the provision that was made because it was awesome. Mm -hmm. And most people were. It's so easy to focus on that one person and be cynical when what we should be looking at are the great multitude who say no word but are actually very grateful for what was provided. And I know many people certainly will. But see, this is what was going on with the disciples. They were looking at those handful of people, or those people who were really recalcitrant, were, uh, not accepting the message of Christ, and they're like, I don't get this. Jesus is preaching a message of love, and people are rejecting this? What's wrong with them? There's a great deal of division going on, and that was what was a result of Jesus' teaching, and his teaching and his message about love. And the disciples are sitting here saying, why is all this division? Why are these people sniping? Jesus wants them to be clear. Not everybody's going to snipe. Some will, but this is the reason why. And that's the context of this parable. And so this parable is actually spoken in front of a large group of people, many of whom ultimately rejected Jesus. But it's spoken to a crowd, especially people who had proven themselves unresponsive to the good news. A lot of them were just there because they wanted food. Or they wanted a spectacular miracle, but they weren't there because of what Jesus truly brought, the message that would transform lives. So what's interesting about it, if you notice in our lesson, it's kind of split. We go verses 1 through 9, and then we skip all the way down to 18. There's a reason for that, because verse 18 to 23 is actually Jesus' explanation of the parable to the disciples in privacy of a home. <clears throat> he takes them aside and wants them to understand what his point was because the parable ultimately is directed to the disciples who are really frustrated and getting somewhat cynical about the treatment they were receiving at the hands of people who were unresponsive to the good news. And so the explanation of the lesson, as I said, is done in private, but ultimately the overarching purpose of the story is to communicate to us why humans respond to the gospel the way they do. Now I'm going to skip this next part, or go through it very quickly about whether it's a parable or not. As I told you before, a parable is a story that has one point to it. This parable seems more like an allegory, but it's not an allegory. An allegory is a story where every detail is important to the story and means something. In this case, many of the details, like who the farmer is and the identity of the farmer and the harvest, is really not important. All that what's important is that overarching thing about why people receive God and why some do not. And so what Jesus does is he has a fourfold structure on the four responses the way people respond to the good news and the message of Jesus Christ. So the conditions of the sower that the sower in the story encounters are very common to those who would be farmers who would recognize it, the rocky ground, the good ground, the weedy ground and all that. In fact, sometimes it can be in one field you can see all those different types of soils. And those conditions exist in the same place. But the distinction that Jesus is trying to make is uh, about the soils has to do with human receptiveness to the Word of God. All four soils receive the exact same message, but all respond differently. And so now we turn over to that next page, and this is where we get to the heart of the matter and what the story is all about. So Jesus says there are four different responses that he's identifying for the sake of his disciples so that they are not deceived or not discouraged when this happens, when they proclaim the good news of God. The very first group of people that Jesus identifies are the non-starters. The people who never respond in any manner to the message of God. They hear the word of God, but they don't do anything with the message that they've received. They, they can even go to church every single Sunday. And I've known people like this. They go to church every single Sunday. They remain unaffected by what God wants to do in their life. It reminds me... It's a guy, true, true story, a guy named John. Um, I'm picking on John today, but it's not this John. Okay? <laughs> this is John that's much older than you. He's gone. He's been gone a long, long time. He was a member of this church, lifelong member of this church. And I guess at one time he came to this church, and then he stopped attending. And when I first uh, came to this congregation as pastor, so this is 1990, he said, oh, you've got to go see John. He really needs to be visited. He's getting up in age. And I go to visit with John. Apparently, he had not been in church in like 50, 60 years. I don't know. But I went to visit with him. And so I uh, went and took him communion. That's what I did. And so I'm talking to him. I want to pray with him and do communion with him. And he said, 
I don't need that communion. I don't need you to pray for me. I'm like, okay, we might see what the problem is here. I said, why not? He said, I don't have any sin in my life. I'm a good person. I'm like, okay, well, those years in church obviously didn't do you any good, John. He kind of looked at me like, huh? I, I tell you, I visit him on a regular basis. I never got him to take communion. He never really wanted me to pray with him or read from the Bible. It was not important to him. He spent all those years in church growing up, and he was unaffected by the good news of what Jesus wanted for his life. So those are the non-starters. But then, verses 21 to 22, Jesus says there's people that are quitters. They get really excited about their relationship with God. And we've seen people like that. They're on fire. They come in and they're hammering all cylinders. And all of a sudden, it fades because they receive some conflict. We actually had a member who, as soon as he became a Christian, he was an older member. He's probably in his 50s. And I say older because I was in my 20s and 30s at that time. So he was really old. So uh, he became a Christian. <laughs> see, see how your perspective changes? It, you know, it's not so old now. But he was an old guy at that time for me. And uh, he was baptized because he'd never been to church in his lifetime. His life got really hard. And he finally just left the church, never came back. And I called him up. I went for a visit with him. And I said, why did you quit? He said, because as soon as I became a Christian, my life got so hard. And I quit being a Christian. And all of a sudden, my life got easier. He said, so to heck with God, if that's the way I'm going to be treated. Well, I know why his life got easier. Because his life changed when he became a Christian, and the friends around him didn't care for that much. And so there was a tremendous turmoil and conflict in his life as a result of the fact that he'd become a Christian. These are the quitters, people who commit to their faith, and then all of a sudden they face tribulation. Tribulation is a generic term for those daily conflicts that we face that are common to everybody's life, like uh, a member of your family who dies, or struggling with your job, or something like that, or persecution. Those are things that are specifically directed at you to inflict harm upon you by other people. And these folks, the quitters, are tripped up by these things. They collapse under the pressure of that tribulation and persecution. It's just another story with this. This is what I kind of like. I remember when I was growing up, my, my, my stepfather was an interesting character. He was actually brilliant. He had a very, very almost unmeasurable IQ. He's incredibly bright. bright. He's one of the brightest people I've ever met as far as intelligence-wise. Common sense, it's another story. Uh, he had some other issues too. And one, one of the issues he had was with his faith. His faith was like a roller coaster ride. It was up and down. I mean wild swings. He was either up here or down here, and there's no in between for him. And so everything was going perfect. Oh, God loves me. Everything was bad. Oh, God hates me, and I hate God. And that's how extreme his faith was. And I, I remember we, uh, we, went, we had a Cadillac, and he didn't want to spend the money on repairing this Cadillac. And I'm like, oh, God, I hated working with him because it was terrible. We spent two days repairing the carburetor of this Cadillac. It was a big process. Get that wrench! Get that wrench! I'd pick up the wrench. No, not that wrench! You mean this wrench? No, not that wrench! You mean the screwdriver? Yeah, that! That's the way it is working with him. I mean, you get smacked for the dumbest things. So we're sitting there two days. It was the most horrendous, hellacious two days just working with him, fixing that carburetor. At the time, at, when it was done, we pulled the car out, or we, we pushed the car out into the driveway, started up. Bam! The carburetor caught on fire. The whole engine caught on fire. The whole car caught on fire. It was spectacular. Let me tell you, the fire department had to be called. I'm telling you, I was sitting there in, in a private, just kind of going like this. It was hilarious. It was funny. But I didn't dare say a word. Um, you know, what, what I was really thinking is, you know, maybe you should have paid the extra money and had somebody do it. Um, but when, that's right. But the, the point of the story ultimately is, after this fire was put out, he said, why does God hate me so much? And what, I was, what I'm thinking, I, I wanted to be really sarcastic and say, it's not that God hates you, it's just that you don't know how to put a carburetor together. You know, it's simply it, right? You Tommy? That's right. You it. So these are the quitters. The people are, things get tough and go bad, and right. south, their faith just collapses. And then, so you got the non-starters, the quitters, you got the third group of people that Jesus talks about, verse 22, the consumers. 
These are the people that are not necessarily against the message that, they were, that, that God is preaching. They just have other con uh, concerns in their life that are more important. Wealth, comfort, pleasures. These are primary concerns to them and pursuits. You know, so it's the people that say, well, you know, soccer is more important. Well, you know, uh, my house is more important. Well, you know, this is more important. And that's more important. Getting wealth is more important. I actually had, speaking of another family, I had a family that came up to me. This is no lie. They said, uh, they said this was, you know, 20 years ago. They're raising their family up and they're growing up and they were in soccer, they were in hockey, they were in this, they were in that. And there's, a, there's just so many things. We'd like to be in church every Sunday, but we just have so much going on. And, you know, we'd love to give more money. We'd love to give more money to the church, but we just don't have any time. And we just don't have any money because we're just kind of broke. Well, yeah, they just bought a brand new house. They brought brand new furniture. They bought brand new everything. They had the best of everything. Well, yeah, I wonder why they didn't have enough money to give away. He said, well, when we're older, we'll be able to give more money. You know what happens to young people who practice that stinginess in their young life? Guess how much and how generous they are when they get to be older. They're just as stingy. They're just, stingy. they lack the same generosity because they practice all their life that stinginess and the lack of generosity. It's people whose life are consumed by other things than their relationship with God. And then Jesus finishes with the, 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 the responders. This was the disciples. Those who accept God's sovereignty over their entire life. And as a result of accepting the message, their actions, i.e. the fruit, are consistent with one whose life has been transformed by God. And so, as Christians, people should notice that there's a difference between you and everybody else. That doesn't mean, okay, you know, I know some of our folks, they let a few expletives fly. You know, I get that. There are times that I'm like, take note. it happens. You know, sometimes they, they do this, they do that. And yeah, we're like, we're humans, we're like everybody else. But at the same time, there should be something that's different in your life that people can point to and say, oh my gosh, there's something different about you. Because you have a relationship with God that people will notice. The amazing thing, according to this parable, ultimately that Jesus is pointing out, isn't that people reject Jesus. It's that anybody accept him at all and produce fruit just because of the pressures that are on us in life. And so Jesus is really in this parable trying to applaud the disciples and say, you know what? Don't worry about how other people respond. Don't get discouraged. Just be faithful to the message and give thanks that you have the privilege and the opportunity to participate in the kingdom message. And so what this means for us, I'm actually going to reverse these. So you're looking at the bottom of your page today and I have number one, number two. Number one actually is number one. And we're going to deal with that second because it's number one. We want to end with the big bang. So I'm going to start with number two under what we learned for today. When we look at this parable, it's often easy to take a look at it and say, well, what Jesus is trying to tell us is to evaluate our lives and whether or not our status, and whether or not we reflect the values of the kingdom of heaven. And that's an important thing to do. We should reflect our lives and whether or not they're and evaluate our lives and whether or not they do reflect the kingdom's priorities. That should be done, but that's only a secondary purpose of this parable. It's not the primary purpose of it. How we respond to the message is ultimately our choice. Are you going to receive the good news of God? Are you going to be like the person who's been planted in rocky soil, or the person in the weeds, or the person who doesn't reject it or rejects the message completely? Or are you going to respond to the message of God? We are meant to evaluate the values of our life does the way we spend our money, does the way we spend our time reflect the values of the kingdom of heaven? So we should go home and think and pray about that. But that's not the primary purpose of this parable. The primary purpose of this parable is to be encouragement to you that are gathered here today. Because it's easy to become cynical and discouraged about how people respond to the message of God. Followers of Jesus do get discouraged by the lack of response to the message of Christ. And we say, I've gone out and I've tried to tell people about Jesus and they, get, they just reject me and I'm just giving up. You know what? Nine out of ten times, maybe that's true. But there's always that one person. Jesus says, don't get discouraged 
Just keep planting seeds liberally because you never know when that one seed is going to find the right soil in which to plant itself in. Some may respond, many will not. Don't be cynical about it. For the purpose of disciples, be faithful in proclaiming the good news in hopes that it will find receptive soil somewhere. Now, I'm coming and speaking to you as one who gets discouraged. And this message is for me. Maybe for you. I don't know. If you get cynical or if you get discouraged, I do. Sometimes we look around and say, we're not getting the results always that we'd like to get. You know, uh, what is it, six months ago, we had the one family come with six, seven, eight people sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. And they're not here right now. Things happen. They we move. planted those seeds. They moved. They're no longer living here. It can be discouraging. So what we do is I spend what you don't know is there were probably six months to a year prior to that that I kept working on them and working on them and working on them. I've known them for quite a while. Finally, after about a year of working with them, they finally responded. They came and several of them were baptized. It was very exciting. And what, like a month later, two months later at most, they were gone because they moved to Duquesne. And you can get really cynical. Guess what? It doesn't add anything to our offering plate. We don't have those numbers anymore. It's very easy to get discouraged and cynical about it. Say, what does it matter? You know, they're going to come, they're going to go, so big deal. But the point is, is that we actually planted a seed in their hearts. And God is faithful. So we should not get discouraged or cynical about it. But we just have to be faithful to plant the seeds and let people respond according to the gift of the Holy Spirit. I hope that makes some sense. Don't get discouraged. I want to finish with one other story. Because as I said, I, I've never believed that our being here has to do with making members. We reach a lot of people that are very transient, and it gets very discouraging. Because, yeah, you know what? I know folks that are pastors of churches that are so much bigger, so much more powerful, and I'm like any other pastor or any other person. I get discouraged. I sometimes say, why can't we be like that? Well, we are what we are supposed to be. We're being faithful with the community God has given us. In this circumstance, very transient community that we live in. People come, we bless them, they go. We hope the seeds of faith are planted, and we hope they're planted well. But it reminds me of a story about Chris. Some of you have heard the story about Chris. I loved it. Chris was one of our youth group members back in the mid-90s. And uh, Chris was a bad kid. He was horrible. He was a drug addict. He was a drug dealer. And, you know, um, he was tough. But we just felt like we were called to just do the best we could to just love Chris and, and just plant a seed. So he's there for a couple of years. He left. And it was easy to kind of be discouraged and say, well, that was a waste of a couple of years, all the work and all the effort I put into Chris. Chris had some transforming experiences. Chris actually signed up for the military, went to Iraq, came back, about, this is like 2002, I guess it was, or whenever it was, 2002, somewhere in there. He came back, so he'd been away from the church for a long time, like seven, eight years, nine years. I didn't think I'd ever see this kid. So I, I, I'm not sure the exact time frame and have to look back at this. But he came back, uh, and one day, we were doing a concert. I, I think Terry was here for that. It was late at night, it was like midnight. And uh, this, this dark blue car pulls up with the tinted black windows and the blue running lights. And, I, and I'm like, it's like midnight. I'm like, oh, good Lord. Why is this guy slowing down in front of the church? You know, you're always cynical and skeptical about this. And I'm scared something's going to happen. And this window rolls down. He says, hey, Pastor Dave. I'm like, oh, at least if somebody knows me, I go over and I say, it's Chris. Chris, he said, you recognize me? I said, oh, yeah, I recognize you. So I, all of a sudden, I'm like, over my fear that I'm going to, something's going to happen to me. And then Chris looks at me and he said, hey, I've been looking for you like the last month. I'm like, oh, good golly. Now I'm, I'm back to thinking I'm going to get killed again, okay? I said, yeah, why think that? He looks at me and he says, because I wanted to tell you something. And so he tells me about being in Iraq. He tells me about how his life, how he was scared spitless and how he remembered the message that we preached him about God's love. And he said, that really sustained me. I came back, he said, I got, I got 
I went, I'm going back to school. I got married. I've got a baby on the way. Uh, I've got a good job. And I just wanted to thank this congregation for loving me. <laughs> Doesn't that make it all worthwhile? Yeah. Uh, okay, you want to see how much that kid put in this offering plate? Nothing. Not a dime. That's how much he put in there. You want to see how often he came to worship? I don't know that he ever came to worship here. It was all in the youth group. Years I spent working with him and praying for him in this church, caring for him. But that result was worth every penny and every ounce of effort. Because ultimately, it's about those people that we plant the seeds in who do respond. You may not even know that. It might take 50 years. You might be dead and gone. You don't know the results of the seeds that are planted. Because God is faithful to raise it up to produce fruit in those hearts that are ready and willing. So don't get discouraged. Put behind you that cynicism. For cynicism has no place in the heart of those who follow Christ. It is discouraging, no doubt. But remember that God is faithful. And there are people who do respond to the good news of Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do come before you this day and are so grateful that there are some who hear and respond to the message. Now, we don't always build the church we would like to. We'd love to have a bigger congregation. We'd love to have more resources to be able to do things with. Well, you know, we just have to be faithful. So help us, God, to put behind us that cynicism, those concerns. Because, God, that has no business in the place in the heart of a Christian. We pray, God, that you would help us to not be discouraged, but be encouraged, God. There is people of faith. There are people of faith in this world because of the work that we have done. And for that we give thanks. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you